I love this mic. Hello, my name is Carl Goodman. I'm the president and CEO of the Florida Holocaust Museum, and I'd like to welcome you all uh, to the museum and tonight's event uh, held by the Temp in conjunction with the Tampa Bay Times newspaper and education program. Uh, this program is funded through a grant from Florida Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities, with funds from the National, Humani National Endowment for Humanities. Um, I want to recognize a few people who are likely to be here. Um, Patricia Putman, Associate Director of Florida Humanities, Jay Ray and all of his colleagues from Tampa Bay Newspapers, Karen Perez from the Hillsborough School Board, Linda Prescott from the Hernando School Board. Um, our thanks and gratitude also goes out to Jody Pushkin and Sue Bedry from the Tampa Bay Times who tirelessly put this event together. Um, so I'll be very brief. It is beyond horrific that such a thing as genocide exists, uh, but it is commendable uh, to the education newspaper that they would take on this topic and encourage students to craft creative responses to it. Um, as our next and feature presenter wrote, the Holocaust showed us the difference between, between those who stand on the sidelines and those who stand up, and we need more of the latter. To that, I would add that thanks to the creative, inventive, and inspiring artwork made by the students here tonight, there are more upstanders in this world, so thank you. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce the chair of the board of the Florida Holocaust Museum and grandson of Holocaust survivors. He'll tell you a little bit about his life and his story, Mike Eagle. If I would have known, I would have stood right there and said, so I didn't have to run over. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to see everybody here. Um, uh, sorry. He loves that microphone. I hate the microphone, so, but I'm going to stand right in front. So um, thanks for, for being here tonight. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay. Okay, great. So um, as Carl mentioned, uh, I'm the, the grandchild of Holocaust survivors. So uh, this is all uh, very, very real to me. These aren't just words. This is what I grew up in. This is what has made me who I am in many respects. Uh, for better and worse, you know, genocide is a very complicated thing that creates a lot of trauma. Uh, those of us, many of us, who are what we call 2G or 3G, second generation or third generation of survivors, are kind of open about the fact that you can imagine what sort of trauma something like um, surviving genocide and losing the rest of your family, having it murdered, quite frankly, for who they were or are, um, what that can do to the family. And I, I think the inclination is to think, oh, you must go through every day thinking the world is the worst place ever because that's what you were taught. Um, and um, not for people like me, not for all of us. Um, actually, I uh, am a, a, an optimist. Um, to a fault sometimes, if you ask my wife. But <laughs> um, I always find something okay with every situation. And I realize as I've gotten older that that's because of what my family went through and the way I was raised. Um, as Carl said, you know, we use the word upstander around here a lot. Um, we, we talk about four kinds of people. There are victims, there are perpetrators, there are bystanders, and there are upstanders. And you don't always get to choose if you're going to be a victim. But the other three are choices. And you get to make that choice every single day in ways that are big and in ways that are small. And all of them matter. And we're all lucky enough that we're not faced with life and death decisions like my family was, or so many like them, um, or so many other kinds of people throughout the world who have been either the victims of genocide or survivors or the upstanders. And that's where I come from. My grandparents are actually in, they're right there. <laughs> and if you look, I always say you can, it's proof I wasn't adopted if you look at my grandfather, because we have basically, um, he's down on our, on our um, history heritage and hope wall as um, a very, as uh, in his early 20s with my great grandmother and he's in his military uniform. And it's like, I'm like, okay, it's, I'm definitely from this family. Like you can really see it. But, um, but the, the short version of my family's story, because there's all sorts of twists and turns and it's like a movie, like so many um, of the uh, survivor families, 
uh, is my grandparents were, um, were farmers in southeastern Poland. And uh, I just want to kind of use my family story because that's what we do here is we use individualized stories to teach these lessons because they're so complicated. And for us, all of us as civilized people, it's very hard to connect with um, these horrors and these incredible things. And so um, what we do is we use individualized stories because it allows us to be able, all of us, to be able to touch this just a bit and really be able to internalize the lessons and hopefully be able to use them going forward. Because my grandparents used to always say, and I'll probably be able to illustrate why, hopefully I'll be able to illustrate why, they used to always tell my brother and me, this was the example of the worst in people, but you must remember and you must tell people that it was also the best in people. And I grew up, that was kind of my normal. I grew up hearing that. Sounds like a heavy thing to hear when you're like seven. But, um, but I grew up always hearing that, that statement. And I realize now as I'm older and I'm trying to impart wisdom, <laughs> how important it was, how my grandparents never let the second part of that sentence go away. They always shared the first part, but it always was coupled with that second part. And it was, it was more important to them that, they knew, that, that we knew that it was the best in people. And I think that's what's made me the optimist and why I, when I see a problem, I just, I don't relent until it's fixed. And um, so my grandparents were farmers in Southeastern Poland and they got married the night before Hitler invaded Poland. So my grandfather used to say that his honeymoon was um, going off to war. And uh, so he came back very quickly, if you know your history, because Hitler marched through Poland very quickly. And, um, and my grandparents, they had a little infant, uh, my Aunt Tony, and uh, she, they were placed in a ghetto like most Jews. And um, I'll keep it as short as I can. My grandfather got a job because the Nazis would use Jews if they could here and there, you know, for things. And since they were farmers, my grandfather, you know, was, was proficient with horseback riding. He got a job um, teaching a, a high-ranking Nazi's wife how to ride a horse. And he used to describe to us the, that the Nazi was like the devil. I won't share with you some of the um, examples of the things that he did, but they were, to say they were inhuman would be friendly um, to, to humans of all ages, including babies. Um, but he used to, my grandfather would say, but his wife was the opposite. She was an angel. And when we think of upstander, imagine being married to like a human version of the devil but being an angel and she told him you need to leave now because my husband just told me that when you're finished teaching me he's going to kill you so leave and take your family with you so my grandfather and his brother my my great uncle martin and my great grandfather and my grandmother made an excuse to get escorted out of the ghetto and they overpowered the two nazis they were with and they took off into the forest and they joined the resistance um, which is something I'm very proud of because people think that all of the Jews went uh, and of the people that were the others. Um, it's important to note that the Nazis didn't, uh, their, their core plan was the final solution to rid um, the world of Jews. But homosexuals, people who were disabled, uh, Romani, there were other people too. And that's important. And because it was all about the other. And that's something we all have to be very sensitive to and um, being an upstander is helping the other. And um, so uh, they joined the resistance and because they, not all Jews, in fact, many did not go like lambs to slaughter as many would think in a genocide. There were many who tried to fight back and did the best they could. And so my grandparents joined the resistance, but they were also shepherded back and forth to, um, through other people who weren't Jewish, who did not have to do anything. Uh, in fact, most didn't, right? I mean, what do we do sometimes when we see something that looks a little difficult to work with or whatever? Just gonna, you know what? I got a headache, right? You know, um, I'll deal with that tomorrow or whatever it is. And, and we're all kind of guilty of that a bit. I don't want to make anybody feel bad. But we're all humans. And sometimes we think, I'll let her worry about it or whatever. And, um, but these people were facing life and death decisions and they stepped up and did what was right. And they, and, and again, like most people didn't do anything because they just went on living their life because it wasn't them. It was somebody else's problem. And we learned when I was growing up about um, these two people, Michal and Katerina Garula, husband and wife, who were also farmers in the same kind of rural area that my grandparents were from. They didn't really know them very well. They knew of them and of each other. Uh, he was a retired policeman and a farmer. And they had three little children. And my grandparents, the four of them, uh, four people in my family that I mentioned, and three other young Jews 
were hidden on their farm uh, in a barn. And on New Year's Eve in 1944, um, my uh, the, the Garulas went to church for New Year's Eve. And uh, they came back, and the, the this is the story I was raised on, one of them. Uh, the husband came back, you know, and said, hey, look, uh, there's somebody in church who's uh, whispering that we're hiding Jews. We just want you to be a little extra careful for the next few nights. Go deeper into the barn, you know, hide, really hide. And my grandfather got skittish for his family, but also for this family that was helping them and um, said, you know, we're going to we're going to go somewhere else for a few nights. Let this cool off. And the husband said, don't worry about it. It, it turns out it was the town drunk. He was like, don't don't. She rambles. Nobody. And so and the other three didn't have a place to go and weren't as scared. So they stayed. My grandparents left and my family left. And um, the next morning, the gorillas went back to church for New Year's Day. And on their way to church, they were stopped by the police. And they were returned to their, their farm. They ransacked the barn. They found the other three. They made them dig their own graves, and they killed them on the spot. And then they arrested the gorillas. And in front of their three children, by the way, young children. And um, they, they found my grandfather had left, like, the family bag there. You know, these things that we're all lucky enough we don't have to think about. Your whole life was in a bag. And so... Um, he left it there, he hid it, knowing they would come back. Well, they found the bag when they ransacked the barn, so they knew there were other people being hidden. And this husband and wife were tortured for six weeks, and they never gave up where my grandparents were. And I get choked up every time I talk about it because I realize that I literally would not be alive without that superhuman act. So, and none of that's an exaggeration. Yeah, it's a straight line between what these people did that I know I hope I would have do the same thing if faced with that situation, but I don't know if I would. Um, I consider myself lucky to not, you know, have to. Um, but that's what I carry with me, not as guilt, as an honor. I am lucky enough to know how amazing it feels to come from that and to be able to share that. And I realize why that was so important to my grandparents to share and why it's become so important for me to share because we all need to take as much of that as we can and bring that into the world, knowing there are people in the world who did things like that and who do things like that. It's incumbent upon us in a, like in a pumped up way to be able, not as, you know, as an obligation, but not in a bad way, to be part of that and to be part of that team. That's the choice that we have. And, you know, again, we're lucky that we don't have to face the decisions at that level. But sometimes we do have really hard decisions to face. The world's getting tough. And uh, if, we're not, if we don't practice on the everyday ones where we have to be an upstander, on some of the ones that are, you know, maybe a little easier, our everyday lives, but still not so easy, we're not going to be ready when the bigger ones come. So you get opportunities to practice every single day. And I just urge you in the name of these people, um, to do that. I wake up every single day and I say, you're not supposed to be here. Do something today. Not in a bad way. Really, I mean it. I wake up with like excitement. I say, you're a miracle. Do something today to be worthy of that. That's kind of my motivation every single morning. And hopefully most of the time I'm successful with it. <laughs> I'm still a person. Um, but, you know, it helps me not drop the ball and make sure I'm doing at least one thing a day that I can say, I made the world a touch better today. And tomorrow is another day. It's another opportunity to do that. So um, that's really, again, one of the most important lessons um, in my view and in the museum's view of the Holocaust. It's that worst in humanity. But if we spend all our time focusing on the horrible things people do, we won't be part of making the change so that goes away. And we can't be, I always say the easy part is talking about how horrible it was because it's like the first place we all go. So we have to be able to have something that we as good civilized people can attach to and take action with. And that's where the upstander part comes in. So, um, and when I see what you, I am a terrible artist. I love art, but I'm really, but stick figures I'm not even good at. So I really marvel at when I see such beautiful work, but I want you to understand that for people like me and, 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 uh, and the museum in general and everybody at the museum, this is what upstanders do you are connecting with these lessons through your art. 
and you are showing the rest of the world your teaching through your art. That is unbelievably important. You should be unbelievably proud of it. It makes me excited and it's heartening for me. And I know it would be heartening for my grandparents. And I see some other people here who I know are descendants of survivors and victims. And I know how it feels and I know they'd agree with me that this is what makes us happy, feel pride, feel good, is knowing the next generation, I'm not that old, but the next generation is carrying all of this forward. You didn't have to do this, but you felt something and you decided to step up. And so I wanna thank all of you for what you're doing because it does make a difference. None of what I'm saying is trite. I believe this and if you think it's trite, again, just think about my family's story. This is very real and you are part of the solution. So giant thanks on behalf of the entire museum, the board, the staff, for all that you do, because this is what's gonna make the difference. Because if anybody asked you, oh, you know, talk to me about this. How, how did you feel when, you, what, what elicited what you did? Boom, you're teaching. And that's what we do, we educate. And if you, one person at a time, that's my, that's my mantra, one person at a time. If I captured one person tonight, mission accomplished. Hopefully more, but, but mission accomplished. To just motivate people to get up and do, and do good. So um, again, a giant thanks, and um, enjoy. <laughs>
and 432 of those were here in Florida. At the same time that these incidents of hate and bias are rising, knowledge of the Holocaust is waning. In a recent study of American millennials and Generation Zers, Florida ranked 48th in the nation in Holocaust knowledge. Half of the young Floridians surveyed could not identify Auschwitz as a concentration camp, death camp, or forced labor camp. Half. Almost half couldn't name any concentration camp, death camp, or ghetto. One in five believe that the Holocaust is a myth or has been exaggerated. That same study found that 54% of young Floridians had seen Nazi symbols in their community or on social media in the last five years, and 57% had seen Holocaust denial or distortion online. So that's why this project and why now. The goals of this year-long project were to, one, increase knowledge of the history of the Holocaust and other genocides. Two, foster understanding of the factors that can lead to genocide. Three, increase understanding of the impact and the consequences of genocide. And four, and most importantly, and this circles back to what you just heard, encourage action to address the root causes of violence and conflict that can lead to genocide. So our project had four components. The first component was an original newspaper and education publication. Our publication reviewed the history of genocide in the 20th and 21st centuries, starting with the Armenian genocide in the very early 20th century. It features interviews with survivors and eyewitnesses of the Holocaust and the Cambodian, Bosnian, and Rwandan genocides. It's aligned to the Florida standards for high school, um, and it was distributed to Tampa Bay Area high schools in January. It's important to note that Holocaust education is required in Florida schools, and we give kudos to the state of Florida for being amongst the leaders in the entire United States and requiring this education from kindergarten on up. Uh, our publication is available as a free download, Print copies are available as long as supplies last. We hope there are copies over there on that table. And we hope that you'll take a copy home with you to read and to share. And if you would like additional copies for your classroom or your community group, um, please let us know. And we would be more than happy to, uh, to help you out with that. So the second component of our project was a series of webinars. We held four webinars featuring guest speakers from the Florida Holocaust Museum, the University of South Florida, and Community Tampa Bay. And we are proud to say that recordings of those webinars are available on our website. So if you're interested, I encourage you to check those out. Third, the third component of our project was this art and poetry contest that we're here to talk about today. Um, this was a contest for Tampa Bay Area high school students, and we invited students to submit artwork and poetry representing the causes, the consequences, the victims, and the survivors of genocide. As you can see from the amazing work um, that we are featuring here tonight, these students did an amazing job of interpreting and expressing this, this really challenging and difficult theme. If you have not had a chance yet to look at the student work that's on display in the back of the room, please take time to do so before you leave tonight. Um, and also I'd like to note that thanks to the generosity of the museum, the works will remain on display through next Monday. So we're really, um, we're really excited that the just visitors to the museum will also be able to appreciate these works. So at this time, I would like to recognize the grand prize winner of our contest. Ala Obaba of Brooks de Bartolo Collegiate High School received a $250 scholarship for her winning artwork entitled A War Raised Generation. Ala created her piece to shed light on the desensitization of Syrian children to violence and conflict during that country's long and ongoing civil war 
and to bring attention to the children suffering over there. So Hala, would you please stand to be recognized and can we give Hala a hand? Thank you. Um, each of our contest judges was given the opportunity to choose one work for special recognition and receive a judge's choice ribbon. Um, we didn't tell these students in advance that they had received this, so I hope that it was a nice surprise um, when they arrived and saw that their work had a ribbon. Um, I'm not sure who was who is here tonight, so um, if you are here, when I call your name, please stand so that we can recognize you. Uh, McKenna Beckner. McKenna, yay! Victoria Stefano. No, Victoria wasn't here. Uh, Romina Herrera. There she is. And Leah Lopez. All right. And we also have, I know, some other student artists and poets in attendance. So would everyone please stand up again and be recognized? All of our student artists and poets. Yep, all of you. We also have um, some teachers, some principals, some administrators, and some school board members with us tonight. And thank you for all that you do to support our students, and thank you for taking the time to come out and support them tonight. So would you please stand up to be recognized? I'd also like to recognize the support of uh, several members of the Tampa Bay Times executive team who have joined us tonight. Uh, Bruce Fallman, Carrie O'Reilly, and Jay Ray, if you could just give us a quick stand. Thank you so much for showing up. I would like to recognize newspaper and education manager Jody Pushkin. Jody wrote the publication and interviewed all of our survivors and eyewitnesses. So she is hiding in the back, but Jody, if you can stand up. I would also like to recognize the support of Florida Humanities. Uh, their funding made this project possible. Without it, we could not have done any of this. Um, Patricia Putnam, our the Associate Director, is here with us tonight. Um, she's also hiding in the back, but thank you, Patricia. Uh, thank you to the Florida Holocaust Museum. They not only provided essential support and expertise, but they also are generously hosting this exhibition and reception here tonight. So please join me in thanking them. And finally, thank you to the students of the Northeast High School Culinary Arts Academy. They provided our refreshments tonight. Um, unfortunately, they're not out here um, to receive your thanks, but let's give them a very loud hand so that they hear us. On behalf of myself, the Times team, our sponsors, thank you again for coming out, supporting our students, supporting this project. Please enjoy the rest of your time here tonight. Enjoy the refreshments. Again, if you haven't had a chance to check out all the artwork, please do so. And we will be around if you have questions about the project. Thank you again. <laughs>